Holy God, may your word be spoken, may your word be heard. Amen. Amen. Please be seated here in the sanctuary, and we invite you to settle in for our sermon here at home. Have you ever had the experience of appearing before a judge who had the power to make a decision over your life? Yes. No and yes. yes. Some of us haven't. Some of us have. It's not fun. It's not fun. <laughs> it's a quite, quite humbling experience. I, I am in the have camp. With my former wife, we appeared before a judge in Plymouth Probate Court to finalize our separation and divorce. And there was a point, so if you've never been a part of a, a divorce, um, God bless you, uh, and may that continue, um, because it's not fun. It, it's a very painful experience. And um, folks come through the court, one after another. There were couples ahead of us. There were couples after us, uh, all appearing before this one judge. And um, when it was our turn, uh, we're separated. We stand on either side because although this was a, um, an amicable divorce and equitable, uh, you're still separated because you have different interests and different, you know, in the eyes of the judge, you have your own standing. And um, I don't know if the judge was tired. I don't know if, I can't remember. I, I think it was before lunch. Maybe, maybe she was a little hangry. I, I don't know. I don't know. But she got a little short with us. And, and the feeling of that of this person who has tremendous power over us, starting to get a little angry, it was very, very disturbing, frightening, painful. And it was around debt, um, and, and there's money, and what we talk about money, but my former wife and I, we were both graduate students, and we had graduate student debt. So the judge is looking at things a little exasperated, says, there's a lot of debt here. And didn't know what to say, so come to the bench. <clears throat> so she called us forward, the two of us. We didn't have any legal representation. We'd done this with moderation, and we'd gotten everything ready, and we were uh, there on our own. Uh, and she asks us, you know, so tell me about this. It's like, well, these were debts we each brought to the relationship, and we're just taking them back. She was like, okay, thank you. Tone completely changed. Suddenly, she was a compassionate presence, executing this painful thing in our lives that we both, at that point, wanted to have uh, accomplished. I will always remember that experience. You don't forget something like that. And when you hear a parable like this of being judged, that's where you go. That's where I went. Is that where you went? You remember your experience before a judge? This parable is a human experience of being in a position of judgment to another person who has authority over you. And that's a frightening place to be. It's a frightening place to be. If it's about our inner lives, which I think it is, if it's about our inner lives, then it's a little helpful, I think, if we're going to hold this story, and I'm calling it a story for now. We'll come back around to what we should call it in a little bit. But when we try to hold this story, to think about other, other, other religions, other cultures, and how they talk about judgment. In ancient Egyptian religion, one of the stories about what happened to one who died and passed over into the afterlife is that your soul was weighed out against a feather. Against a feather. A feather was put in one side of the scales and your soul was put in the other. And if your soul was heavier than the feather, you went to a place of suffering. That's kind of profound. That's kind of profound. If we think about our Eastern brothers and sisters, Hindus, Buddhists, we have the concept of karma. We have the concept of karma. So you enter the afterlife with the deeds and misdeeds, the good and bad things you have done, weighed out with one another. And what unfolds for you in the afterlife is a function, it's almost mathematical, of that balance between the kind of person you were a person of goodness and compassion and righteousness, or a person of misdeeds, self-seeking, selfishness. That's a little different. Both of those are a little different than having an individual before whom you are presented to have your soul's fate weighed out. The culture that a story comes from matters. It matters. 
And there's lots of stuff in the Bible about judgment. There's also lots of stuff about God's love for us. God being our shepherd and seeking us out when we're lost and defending us when we're accused. So all of this stuff in, in our parable, oh, I slipped what I'm going to call it. It actually doesn't say it's a parable, does it? If we're listening, it says, this is how it will be when we come to the end. I think it's more like a parable. I think it's more like a parable. And I say that because of the culture from which this story of judgment came. And, and a friendly reminder, we're asking this question, who are we? Who are we as the church? Who are we as followers of God in Christ? Who are we? And what does this story of the sheep and the goats tell us about who we are? That's, that's the frame within which we are working. So if we think about the, the world in which this, this telling arose, it was dominated, absolutely dominated, by the Roman Empire. I don't think I could word that use dominated enough for us to comprehend how completely and totally life and experience was shaped by the presence of the Roman Empire in the days that the New Testament was composed. Everyone knew who the Roman Emperor was. Everyone had a Roman legion nearby who would be keeping the peace, as we might say, but that's not what they did. They enforced the order, and they did it with ruthless violence. And we have in our Christian faith one of the most graphic and disturbing examples of that. What am I thinking of? It's right there in the heart of our story. The crucifixion. The crucifixion. The way that Romans treated non-Romans. A horrific form of execution. Absolutely horrific. This is, this is the world in which this story is being told by the followers of Jesus about what really is going to happen. About where real power lies. About what actually matters. They're making a radical statement. And they're trying to counterpose what to everyone's eyes in their time would have been the truth. That violence is what controls the world. That the Romans are the ones who are chosen because they're on top. Hard to fathom. Hard to get ourselves in the imaginative space where we could get a feel for what that must have been like for our ancestors in the faith. But that's where this text comes from. That's what this text is a response to. It's a response of an oppressed peoples to their sense of the value and importance of what they see as really significant. Justice, love, compassion, mercy. In a world that values those things not at all. And that has the power of the sword to back it up. That's a lot going on in this story of judgment. That's a lot going on. And our ancestors in the faith, they, they just believed that this couldn't be what God wants. That there would be a capricious, violent empire over the world holding anyone down who dared stand up to be free and their own nation or their own people. Were they right? It's not a rhetorical question. Were they right? I, I would say they were. And here's why. Where is Rome? Italy. Thank you. Where is the Roman Empire? Everywhere. Everywhere. Interesting. In some ways, its after effect is still everywhere. But its core structure broke down. It fell. It's gone. Its legacies and ideas, you know, that's, that's very insightful, actually, that it's still permeating our culture. Very true. But the empire itself is gone. And I would argue every nation that has tried to impose through violence its will on the world has broken down. They keep coming. They keep trying. I think we're seeing something in a similar vein unfolding in our own history right now. But those efforts are doomed to fail. 
They're doomed to fail. They're already judged. In a deep sense. About what's true and real at the most core level. And what's true and real at the most core level are God's values. And God's presence and God's power. Creativity. Life. Justice. Mercy. Community. Love. Those are the most real things. And anything in the world that doesn't have those values at its core is going to fall apart. It's going to fall apart. It's already judged. We ourselves, in ourselves, we have this fear about life, about the world around us, about one another. It's there all the time. We could talk about evolutionary biology, we could talk about psychology, we could talk about all kinds of things. But all of us carry this fear within ourselves. And it causes us to feel conflict and uncertainty. And when other people are outside throwing things at us, some of them are very effective at touching those things and getting us off, cue, off skew, out of kilter. We need to keep coming back again and again and again to God's love for us. We need to come back again and again and again to how much God in Christ holds us dear and precious. We're about to close out the question of who we are and enter into the question of who is Jesus. So it's a good time to remind ourselves Jesus is the one who loves us. Who are we? We're the ones loved by God in Christ. And at the core of that story, at the core of that story, is that Jesus, a divine being, enters into our messy, grungy little world to bring us light and life and love. An act of humility, not dominance. Because this, this story of the sheep and the goats and, and the king, the, the human one, the glorious judge at the end of time, it could make you think that they're trying to appropriate the Roman sense of the world. There should be an emperor in all their glory on top of everyone else, asserting their authority and exercising control. You could think that that's what they were talking about. And folks make that mistake all the time. They take the idea of Christ the King as Christ should be our King. Have authority over us and other people. And, import, and, and, and impose our sense of morality and rightness on our whole culture. They're a very scary group of people who think that's what Christianity is about. And we need to be conscious of them. And watch what they do. Because they're dangerous. And they're profoundly wrong. They're profoundly wrong. This scene was, let's say, brought into the world, imaginatively, spiritually, by a people who were being killed for their faith. A people who had no power in the world at all. And they were trying to find their dignity. And their sense of the dignity of all the people who were on the bottom of the world with them. The hungry, the poor, the naked, the sick, the imprisoned. Not people valued by the Romans, but people valued by God and Christ, and valued by those inspired by his teaching. So now we've got some, some Christians who just seem to have gotten lost in that. And they're looking for a Christian emperor. And that's not what this is about. This story is about the values and the reality of God's spiritual love and justice being what's the true ruler of the world. What truly matters. What truly has command of things. Not always as quickly as we would like. Not always as clearly as we would like. But absolutely true.
We are the community of God in Christ trying to live out these values in a world that doesn't always want to hear them, doesn't always treasure them, but that needs them. That needs them. Because the alternative to these values are destruction. Those who live by the sword will... Someone said that. Someone kind of wise said that. It's the truth. It's the truth. And those who live by love will be saved by love. Those who can recognize that the majesty of God is present even in the poor and the hungry and the thirsty and the naked and the sick and the imprisoned, those who can see that, they're already saved. They're already seen as sheep. And that's a beautiful thing. I want to pull out one more piece from this story that, that I think is easy to miss. And, and it picks up on the reading that set us off on this journey of asking, who are we? When, well, all the way back when on All Saints Day. You remember All Saints Day? Well, of course you do. You remember it all. Beautiful. We heard from the book of Revelation. And our first hymn echoed this. The voices of the sinless across the crystal sea. We heard from um, Revelation chapter 7 of all those dressed in white who are before God and before the Lamb and singing their praises to God who has just comforted them and healed them and blessed them up with abundant eternal life. And if you don't remember, the people who are dressed in the robe, that white robe, are from all the nations, all the tongues, all the peoples of the world. It's not one race. It's not one country. It's the good in everyone around the world. A diverse community of human beings, blessed and holy. Well, these sheep, where did these sheep come from in this story today that we heard from Matthew 25? Did the angels pull out the Israelites and set them on the right hand and everyone else went on the left? There were sheep and goats. There were sheep and goats. And where were they from? Farm. From the park? From the farm. <laughs> from the farm. That's a good place to find sheep and goats. They were from all the nations of the world. Oh, yeah. That's right. Not one people but the good in all people. That's profound. That's profound. In a country where there are those who are calling Christianity a white religion, and the white race as the one that is of most value, this gospel knocks them down. It judges them. Right there in their own Bible, if they took the time to read it closely, which they don't. I'm a little judgy. As long as I hold it in humility, it's okay. When we strive for this diverse community of the church, people of all kinds, people from all cultures, people from around the world, we're reflecting the biblical vision of what it means to be the blessed community of God. We're reflecting it beautifully. So these values that, that also have a home in little l liberal democracy, in our American traditions, these values, that, that's where they have just a little bit of touch, a little bit of a sprinkle of holiness. Just a little bit. And they're worth fighting for. They're invested with sacred worth. Because this is what God's vision for humanity is. Every person seen as of infinite worth. The dignity of every person respected. And justice brought into being for everyone. It's an unending task, striving for this. Part of the, 
part of the, 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 the inner appeal, and there is a certain appeal to this judgment scene, is that it's over. Right? It's over. Jesus has come back, and the struggle is over. Well, so long as we're in these bodies and in this world, our struggle is unending. But knowing what's ultimately in control can be renewing and strengthening. Another point of this story. As we struggle, day by day, week by week, to make manifest this glorious, beautiful, diverse community of good people, in a good community. On those down days, let us take hope that the last word and the last day will be blessed. Thanks be to God.